All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to our fifth um, teaching artist webinar. And today we are going to be learning all about teaching artistry and social emotional learning. I am Kimberly Washburn Mott, the Arts Learning Director at the South Carolina Arts Commission. And I have the privilege of um, introducing our host today, Jeff Lambden. Jeff is a teaching artist who shares his workshops and residencies in mime, theater, mask, circus arts, playwriting, ensemble techniques, melodrama, and commedia dell'arte, as well as arts integration. He, along with Sheila Kerrigan, is a founding member of the Southeast Center for Arts Integration. In 2010, he attended the Lincoln Center Institute International Educator Workshop. He was a North Carolina A plus fellow from 2005 until, until to 2021. Whew. I struggled to get that out. Jeff, please take it away. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Kimberly. And welcome all you webinarians near and far. I see many faces we've seen before. Greg, good, good to see you. Um, Maria, there are a lot of you out there. Okay. Now, welcome to the South Carolina Arts Commission's fifth professional development workshop for teaching artists. And this one is titled what you need to know about social emotional learning. Now, I'm Jeff Landon. I am a teaching artist, and I'm your host for all of these development, development workshops. To begin with, I'd like to introduce to you someone who will be joining us later, but who is with us for the whole time, right? Elena Vest, a certified arts teacher and registered arts therapist who is currently teaching at East Cooper Montessori Charter School. Wave to everybody, Elena. Is. Yes, and the crowd goes crazy, right? Okay, <laughs> good, good, good. <clears throat> okay, back to topic. We are talking about social emotional learning. Sometimes it's called social and emotional learning, and in other states, it the name is varies as well. But in South Carolina, and this is where you have to make sure you get all your information for South Carolina teaching artists, it's called social emotional learning. And we realize that in our audience today, um, you all are, some of you are brand new teaching artists, some of you are well seasoned teaching artists, and we're going to try to give information applicable to all of you, at, and you can use it. Now, the way today's webinar is designed is we'll introduce a topic, we'll discourse on it, and after the topic, we'll, there will be a short time for questions, all right? today when you ask your questions along the way you can type them into the chat does everybody know how to do that give me a thumbs up yeah you know how to type into the chat and then if you want to speak um to us personally raise your electronic hand does everybody know how to do that yes it's down there in the bottom under reactions you click on reactions you'll see um uh, clapping hands, you'll see all sorts of things. And you can you can raise your hand, it says raise hand. And that's what you do. The reason I encourage you to do that rather than just raising your hand on your screen is because if you raise your electronic hand, it scoots you up to the top of the queue and we actually see you, okay? So that's, that's how we'd like you to ask your questions today. And um, let's get started. If you'll bring up the, the first slide, Kimberly. All right. Okay. Now, I want you all to realize that this is a three year project of professional development for teaching artists. We're in year two. Okay. This is our fifth webinar about the business of teaching artistry. And as I mentioned before, this one's about social emotional learning. Our focus today will be why teaching artists need to know about this aspect of education and how the arts fit into the scheme of things in social emotional learning. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Back one up. You went to there, Kimberly. Go back one because I want to talk about the previous webinars first. Okay. Whoops, now we're back here. Anyway, if you were with us during webinars one, two, three, and four um, in 2022, uh, we covered many topics. We first top covered the topic of the nuts and bolts of teaching artistry, 
We then cop worked on educational standards. Then we worked on marketing your teaching artistry. And the fourth one was about assessing arts integrated lessons. If you missed any of them, or you want to refresh yourself on these topics, you can go to this website. They are all logged into the South Carolina Arts Commission YouTube channel, and you can find all of them there. This webinar will be posted there later on once it's all put together. All right. Now, and I encourage you to ask questions along the way. If we don't get to all your questions, please, right? Please email us. And if you go to the next slide, okay, my email address is right there on the card. Wooly at mindspring.com. All right. And as Kimberly told you, I'm a performer and a teaching artist, and I work at fairs and festivals throughout North and South Carolina. Today, I am broadcasting from the beautiful Chapman Cultural Center in Spark, Spark, I call it Sparkle City, Spartanburg, South Carolina. All right, so that's where we are today. All right, let's go to the next slide. Social emotional learning. Okay, that's what it's called. Now, how did we get here? What's it all about? You know, as with many Western ideas, the beginnings are ancient. Plato, in his writings about education in his treatise called The Republic, explains that, and this is a quote, by maintaining a sound system of education and upbringing, you produce citizens of good character. End of quote. Now, flip up several centuries to the 1960s, James Comer began piloting a program called the Comer School Development Program, which centered on his speculation that, and this is a quote, the contrast between a child's experiences at home and those in school deeply affects the child's psychological development and that this in turn shapes academic achievement. And going further into the 80s and 90s, see this, we didn't, we didn't invent this yesterday. In the 80s and 90s, there were programs like the WT Grant Foundation's Consortium on School-Based Promotion of Social Competence. And in that program, they listed emotional skills necessary for emotional competence. Okay, fast forward another several years, 1994. The term social emotional learning is being used widely and the organization, originally known as the Collaborative to Advance Social and Emotional Learning, was created. Let's go to the next slide. We now know the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning as CASEL, C-A-S-E-L. So when you hear somebody say, talk about a castle diagram, a castle competency, a castle this, this is what they're talking about. Okay. Let's go to the next. All right. Now, the South Carolina Department of Education is into this big time. From their website, and write down this, this um, URL up here, because that's where the best information for South Carolina about social emotional learning is they have on this website and it's updated every once in a while, okay? And here's the definition. Now, the South Carolina Department of Education is focused on promoting social emotional learning to enhance the building of positive school climates and the healthy development of young people. Now they're doing this because research demonstrates that students who receive support for social and emotional learning in their schools, they do better academically and they do better socially and they do better behaviorally. Social emotional learning has also been shown to positively impact economic mobility and mental health outcomes. Developing these skills in our students 
is an important part of meeting the needs of the whole child. Now today, this my little brief overview of social emotional learning is necessarily rudimentary. As always, I encourage you as a teaching artist to study the concept further at your own desired depth. You do not have to become an art therapist. What I think the most important thing a teaching artist can get from all of this idea is how your work impacts the social and emotional competencies of the children you're dealing with when you're teaching. Because there is no way you can teach a lesson in art and not touch upon social emotional competencies. All right. So you can find out more by going to this URL at the top. All right. And let's move on to Castle. This is called the Castle Wheel. Now, I, I encouraged you earlier make sure you always look at information from South Carolina. There are states that have four competencies. They've abridged the Castle model. There are states that have seven. So make sure your information when you're looking it up comes from South Carolina. And in South Carolina and the Castle folks have identified five competencies and they're listed here in the wheel, all right? Self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness, all right? Now, as the students work and grow in these five competencies, the question becomes, how do we support them? And as teaching artists, as arts educators, and as artists, another question is, what role do the arts play in supporting students in their social emotional learning? All right. I'm only going to go in depth into one subject, self-awareness. Let's go to the next slide, just so you get an idea. All right. These ideas, integrating personal and social identities, identifying personal, cultural, and linguistic assets, identifying one's emotions, these are the items, the line items that add up to self-awareness. And anytime you teach a lesson that involves any of these linking feelings, values, and thoughts, when you have a child look at a work of art and, and say what it means to them, you're, do, you're working on self-awareness. And as I said before, you're not doing this for therapeutic reasons, you're doing it because it's your art, okay? All right, let's go on to my, my, my big thing here. Now, as you can see from the, the concept of social emotional learning is tied directly to the educational goals here of the South Carolina graduate, right? This profile of the South Carolina graduate, you've heard me talk about it before, right? It was created in order to identify the knowledge, skills, and characteristics a high school graduate in South Carolina should possess in order to be prepared for success as they enter college or pursue a career. The profile is intended to guide everything that is done in support of college and career readiness of all students who graduate from schools throughout South Carolina. Now, the South the profile of a South Carolina graduate also has competencies. All right, let's go to the next slide. This is the slide where it parallels the castle competencies in social emotional learning, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making with competencies from the profile of the South Carolina graduate, all right? There are about a dozen of them, but you can see them here. They're written out, you know, self-awareness involves um, navigating conflict, right? Learning independently, sustaining wellness, and developing networks. And the others are also correlated, right? Okay. This, again, this is why it's important for you as a teaching artist to understand the concepts and competencies involved in social emotional learning. 
When you develop and implement your lessons, you need to understand how to support this work, which is meant to permeate all of the educational ideas and ideals, all right? The better you understand this, the more relevant your work and your art form will become to the educational world. The more clearly you can communicate the connection between your work as an artist and social emotional learning, the more relevant you will appear to those who might want to hire you. Your teaching artist work will be seen as supporting the entirety of the educational system in South Carolina. That's why we're here today. All right, let's stop the share. That's a lot of gobbledygook. Does anybody have any questions, thoughts, ideas? We're opening up the floor. Feel free to. All right. I don't hear anything. I don't see anything in the chat. We're ready to go on. All right. Okay. Now for the in depth work. I turn now to our special guest, Elena Vest. Elena, take it away. All right. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, it's, it's good to be here with all of you today. Um, so I am going to share a presentation with you today. And um, I want to give you um, access to this presentation later. There might be parts of the presentation that uh, you would like to revisit at another time. And um, I've included here also my contact information. I am always happy to speak to anyone about um, their work with our schools and any way that I might answer some questions that you have about um, social and emotional learning and the creative process. Um, so just a little bit about me. I taught for several years and decided that I wanted to um, study art therapy. And <clears throat> so I did that and I went to Drexel University and studied and uh, worked as an art therapist for several years and love working in schools and developed a program in schools. And then when I transitioned back to South Carolina, living and working here, um, decided to go back into the classroom teaching. And it is just such a powerful platform where you form um, relationships with um, students. And I think um, it's, a, it's also very special to have guest artists come into classrooms and come into school communities. Um, so I'm very happy to speak with you about this today and any other time. Um, so, um, what I wanted to start talking about is art therapy and art education. Art therapy is a, a growing field, and I think uh, there are lots of questions about the field itself that can lend itself to um, helping all of you as you begin talking about social emotional learning, um, maybe with prospective schools, and just kind of talking about how how it's a, an important piece of what you are offering if you were to come and do a residency or a presentation. So, um, art therapy and art education have a few areas where they they overlap, and then areas where things are very different. Uh, when we think about the um, the profile of the South Carolina graduate, and we think about um, social and emotional learning. Um, and um, castle and the wheel that we just looked at, um, we can see how some of those things naturally happen within the creative process. Um, so if you are in counseling or in therapy, whether it's art therapy or music therapy or um, verbal therapy, it's individual and small group. Um, and the goals of the client would determine what happens in that time. So that's the primary focus. It's about the thoughts and ideas and emotions. Um, and artistic skills naturally can develop over time, but it's not the focus. In art education, it's often, as we know, larger groups. Um, sometimes can be small group or individual, but it's very goal-based, based on standards. Um, and uh, there's a focus on the technical skill mastery. 
Um, there's often a scope and sequence of instruction and um, it's aligned with national and state standards. In the middle there, you have this creative expression. You have that drawings, um, movement, music can tell stories. We can connect with those stories. And um, there's both the process of making and the product. So um, one thing that I spend a lot of time doing um, with art educators in our state is talking about how um, there is such a push for social and emotional learning. And I think sometimes our art teachers and this is what they communicate with me, this is what I have felt, is that um, we need to do something more, but really social and, and emotional learning is innate. It's, it's in the process. So it might be that we might do some things a little more intentionally, but it's also important to recognize that we want to make sure we're respecting um, the size of the group and the vulnerability. So we don't really have to adapt very much. Instead, just be intentional about the fact that this is a part of the process and we can respect that. So here I'm sharing with you, um, this is what school counselors use to help them um, understand tiers of support and intervention. So a tier one support for a school counselor would be large group. It might be going pushing into classrooms and um, talking about certain topics without asking anyone to share or be vulnerable in that, um, in that situation. And so I think that piece is very important. Um, even though I'm a registered art therapist, when I'm teaching, I am, I'm an art teacher and that's my role. Uh, students, you know, just as in any class are graded. And so I'm not going to ask or require um, that they share something that might be very personal um, or do, you know, provide a directive that would be one that I would utilize in a therapeutic situation. Um, this is an ethical conflict. And so um, it's really important to be very distinct about that and also helps teach healthy boundaries, um, which I think is important. Another part of the creative process, what do I want to share and what is personal and my own? Um, now, I, of course, when students are at school and they're making art in classroom setting, they are making art knowing they're in a classroom setting and that they are probably going to share that it might be uh, put on display. Um, and so the topics being tailored to that. Um, and then tier two would be um, individual or small group. And so that would be in a counseling session, it would be the same. So that might be where some of those more personal topics are discussed and it just stays within that space. And then of course, um, tier three being individualized um, and um, maybe even with wraparound support services. So I, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with this model, but I think it's very powerful to use if you are in a situation where you are um, working with a school and they ask, um, how is social and emotional learning gonna be a part of what you're offering? It might be that this gives you a platform to talk about um, how it is innate when we are asking students to just be creative in general because being creative um, really helps them tap into um, their own um, interpersonal problem solving skills, frustration tolerance. Um, being creative requires us to um, become uh, more comfortable with things not going the way we expect them all the time. And all of those things feed back into interpersonal skills that they're developing. Um, so one thing that you can do within your sessions, within your um, instruction or your work with students is to be sure that you provide clear boundaries for, for children um, or for youth, for teens, making sure that they understand exactly um, where and how and what you are expecting is very healthy. Um, and students will often, um, they will look for those boundaries, even if they're not conscious of that, just to help them feel comfortable. And I'm going to explain a few things that I always do very intentionally in my classroom that I find to be very helpful. Um, things that I might have done before, um, but just did not realize exactly why they were so important. Um, it's reassuring for students to know what the routines are or how the space is organized. Um, it's um, helpful for them to have an assigned place to work 
to know where their place is to work or who they might be working with. Having a space for supplies, a space to store the artwork, and just knowing overall how things are going to be managed. I find in my work with students, there's still times after this is year 16 for me that um, I'm reminded I need to talk about when we might be displaying our artwork. Over the past few years, the, some of those opportunities were not as um, prevalent because of COVID. And so now that we are displaying artwork again, uh, whereas in the past, it's something we've done every year, now we have more community events again, and we have more opportunities to showcase and to come together to celebrate artwork. So um, explaining to students, sometimes we might pull your artwork and put it on display is very important rather than just the surprise of that happening. It helps them know what to expect. Um, so creating a predictable environment. This is a resource from the Art Education University, and I've gone ahead and linked that resource in the presentation for you. Um, I love this because it just goes over different things that you can do, posting a routine, updating them on the amount of time that you have to work, just reminding them we have a few more minutes. All of these are things that can put them at ease and help support them in a social and emotional way. Um, being mindful of physical space and giving them reminders of how to be mindful of that. Um, sometimes less can be more also. Um, just going ahead and removing things from the space that are not serving the purpose of what you're doing at that time, if that's possible. Um, you can change the transitions of the room, can go with lights and music, and that can be, you know, for timing, that can be very helpful um, in giving them nonverbal cues. Um, so all, I think this is just a very um, health, helpful guide. But let's talk a little bit about resiliency. Because really, when we think about the creative process, resi resiliency is innate within it because it is helping uh, focus on strengths. And so when you're working with students, keeping that lens in the forefront that you're looking for students' strengths and pointing those out to students and helping them grow in their own creative confidence. So resiliency is defined by the capacity to recover quickly from a difficult situation. And if you can think about a time when maybe you were drawing or painting something and maybe it was a new supply or it was just even being in a group while you're doing it versus being alone, sometimes that can be difficult. And so when we are, when we are doing that with students, uh, really focusing on when we see them succeeding and helping them feel empowered by that. Um, so what are some factors? that contribute to resiliency, positive relationships with trusted adults. So um, I think when you are going into a school setting, you are in, in essence joining that team for that week and being um, an adult that is a part of the um, arts team that supports these students and classroom teacher team that support the students and spend so much of their day together with them. So um, you become another adult that they can develop a positive relationship with. Even if it's not a very long relationship, it's very meaningful. You're going to give them a fun experience that they are going to connect with. Um, having your expectations be very clear and clear boundaries helps support the development of resiliency. Um, depending on your topic, whether it's drama or creative writing or um, music or art, dance, um, giving them hope for the future, helping them connect with a vision of themselves, um, doing things that they want to do, a healthy vision for themselves and their belief in themselves. One of my favorite, um, my favorite specialists on trauma is um, Bruce Perry. And maybe some of you are familiar with Dr. Perry. Um, he has the um, Trauma Research Foundation. And um, he talks about how prevalent trauma is in our society. And so if you are working with a large group of students, it is inevitable that um, trauma has not touched their lives, depending on the person in different ways. And so uh, one of the reasons that we have this, um, the importance of social and emotional learning is because this is a need in our society. 
And it is something that um, is a part of our whole development. So um, in order to really be able to support students from all perspectives, we have to think about how their social and emotional lives are developing alongside um, their academic development, their physical development. Um, their psychological health is important in supporting who they are and what they need and who they will become. Um, Bruce Perry says that the more healthy relationships that a child has, the more likely that he or she will be able to recover from trauma and thrive because relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. Um, so I think even just um, in spending time with them and um, letting it be that they and leaving that time with you feel feel that and that belief in themselves. Um, so the question that often comes up is can art making experience both give, can they give a lot of structure and all of the, the clear boundaries and also this freedom? And maybe now is a good time to kind of take a break and see if anyone has any questions about any part of the presentation so far. If you have any questions, you're free to pop those into the chat. Or if you would like to raise your hand using the raise your hand feature. I threw one Just in the chat, Elena. Do we have any questions? I have one. I threw one in the chat. Um, and okay. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, I've I've heard a lot about students coming back into the classroom um, after COVID closures and not really having the social and emotional skills to just be in a classroom space with each other or just follow sort of the basic procedures of the school day. And I'd just love to hear your take as a classroom teacher and also as sort of a specialist in, in social emotional learning. Um, have you seen an increased need to lean into those basic procedural structures and continual cueing with the students as you're working with them? Um, how, how have you seen, even over just this last school year, how have you seen um, improvement in that sort of how do we even exist around each other -ness? Yes. Well, I will say that that is um, absolutely true, that I have noticed um, just that a lot of our students um, miss a lot of social development time. And if we think about what happens in the first years of school, that's when you really develop a lot of norms and um, you learn how to share space and how to be within a group. So um, we're seeing, and I think it was um, CPI, the Center for, hmm, what does the acronym stand for? Let me look that up for you really quick. But um, they um, provided um, a webinar that I um, recently attended, and it was talking about how just in doing a survey that they noticed that, um, that the most that we were seeing where we were seeing the most need for support was in you know grades first through third and just really um that it was a lot of it was the being together so you do have to set very clear boundaries with how to um how do we come into the room how do we respect each other so everyone can hear the demonstration and everyone can understand our learning target. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking about how to be together and um, and then really celebrating when we see that progress. So I do think that is very important and I'm glad you brought that up. And um, really, I think one of the things that I have found to be very helpful is um, teaching self-regulation through breathing and through movement, um, which, I mean, these are things I'm sure some of our artists are immediately like, oh, well, that's a part of what I do when I'm working with them in theater and music and, um, you know, um, helping them begin to visualize um, ways to calm themselves down when they become frustrated. And some of the things I'm going to share today are particular um, art objectives and lessons I like to use in different times of the school year that touch on and provide a language that I use in the classroom that help with those things. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. 
All right, let's see. So I think I'm sharing again. <laughs> can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to jump back in unless we had any other questions. Um, here are some things that I think are important to remember, and these are specific to art, but they can also be transferred to any creative process. Um, when I studied art therapy, I actually studied creative arts and therapy. So I was studying right alongside with um, music therapists and dance therapists as well. Um, and a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's really more about the creative process and how it is healthy for us. Um, and so when I go into a classroom, one of the things that I recognize is, and it's not that it is always easy um, because we're all human, but sometimes the most important thing I can do is take a deep breath myself and say, how can I meet this student where they are so I can take them where I want them to go? Another thing I think is a really important um, thing to always remember is that the art or the music or the performance is a mirror of where that person is in that day and time. And so that can look very different depending on the day, but what can that tell me about how I can support that student? And then the other thing is to ask a lot of open-ended questions. Tell me more about your work. What is the story of your work? Oh, I'd love to hear reflecting questions. A lot of, you know, oh, I'm, why, uh, why do you think that might be? Questions that ask them to open up and share more because often when they engage with us and they ask questions, those questions tend to be sometimes what they also want us to ask of them. Um, one thing that I find is really helpful, it's a great resource if you are looking for just one of many we can find on how creativity is healthy for the brain. Um, I've included the link here. So um, it just talks about how resilience is boosted through the creative process. Um, and so I'm gonna share a few art lessons with you now. Um, and these are different instructional strategies that help support the development of creative confidence and resiliency. Um, one being that it focuses on encouraging flexible thinking and a growth mindset. So if we look at um, that wheel and we think about um, self-management and self-awareness, flexible thinking, being able to tolerate discomfort, being able to see um, the potential for growth and that we are all growing and learning every day is a big part of that. Um, two, offering opportunities to work within a wide variety of materials under different conditions and in working with those, seeing strengths and areas for growth. And three, providing students with a safe opportunity to provide um, a space where they can practice coping and frustration tolerance um, with support and um, helping them develop courage to try new things um, and to take risks um, in a way that feels safe for them. So um, through the art process, how can we see these things and how can we let them share these things? Also, um, there's a lot of room for interpretation. There's a lot of room to share at their own level of comfort. Now, one thing I will say that I think is really important is to really honor each child and sometimes even inviting them to share things at a later time. And I think we probably all can think of a time when maybe we have felt compelled to share something and then later felt like, oh, I wish I hadn't shared quite that much. Um, I think sometimes um, we find as teachers that it can be good to help navigate that. Um, and so um, as an artist coming in, if you ever feel like it's a time when maybe a student is sharing a lot, you can always invite them to say, I want to talk with you more about that. And that can help them establish a boundary and really reflect if they want to share more or if they want to not. But it, it also gives you that connection to open it up for that later. 
we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, so if you are on a topic and it starts to feel like maybe they're opening up. Okay, so um, a few um, projects that I really love. One is Beautiful Oops. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's one of my favorite books. And in my classroom, which is where I am right now, I have a huge poster all about mistakes and what we can do when we make them, giving options um, right underneath the book itself. Um, and I am drawing graffiti spaghetti, a grounding doodle, and a zentangle. So here are some... I guess, quotes that I like to try and let students embrace. I can learn from my mistakes. Art is a way of learning. My product will be unique. I may not have mastered this yet, and my mind grows stronger when I am creative. <clears throat> so artists can be creative problem solvers. That is one of the goals of the profile of the South Carolina graduate. So here's the book. And here is, I'm gonna mute and just play a little demonstration. I actually made this during COVID when teaching virtually. Um, so do you ever feel that you've made a mistake? I start my year off with this book um, and I give students the opportunity to either make a mistake on purpose on their paper or provide them with mistakes. And we have a lot of fun seeing what we can turn them into. So here is a little demo. So as you can see, it's very playful, it's very fun, but it addresses a topic that can sometimes bring our students to tears when they feel like they have totally messed up on whatever they were trying to do. And it's really nice when that becomes a part of the language. Um, so this can be, if you're not familiar with um, Janelle Monet, she has the song, The Power of Yet. It's a lot of fun to play this song within the art making process as they're creating art and just reminding them that everybody makes mistakes. Um, and then again, like I said, I, I keep reminders of what can you do? Can you erase it? Can you turn it into something else? Can you cut out a piece of paper and glue it on top of the part that you, you know, feel like you messed up? And then just letting them also understand how mistakes are a roadmap. Because if we know what we don't like, then it can help us navigate to finding what we do want more of. So all of these things can empower them um, as they move forward. So here you can see just some examples of some beautiful oops that students have um, shared and submitted um, in the past, a torn piece of paper or a scribble or a drip of paint. Um, and if you're not familiar with that book, I hope you will definitely um, get that and check it out. I'm so sorry that the, the sound didn't play. <laughs> I wondered if that was going to work, but it was just a song um, that was playing along with the visual demonstration. So if we look at um, 
back at this wheel, we can see how, um, you know, really this is kind of probably focusing more on the blue area of self-awareness. What do I like? What do I not like? Self-management. How can I regulate my emotions to tolerate the discomfort of things not going maybe how I envisioned or expected in order to be able to still reach the goals that I have? Students often want a new piece of paper. They want to start over. They feel like they just can't tolerate. And it can be asking a lot of them to stick with it, but it can help them grow and overcome and develop those social and emotional skills. So I encourage you to go ahead and prep them ahead of time and say, if you feel like this doesn't go the way you expected, that's normal and that's common. It's typical. I guess I like that word more than normal, typical, that that happens as part of the process. Um, and then that kind of leans into the responsible decision-making because are we going to blow up or are we going to get angry or are we going to, you know, go back to the drawing board and look at, you know, the options and what decision will we make and how will we navigate this? Um, and maybe giving them a few choices. One that is more what you hope they will do and one that is another option that works for you. Um, teaching students to be resourceful with materials. So this is a really great for self-management. Art can be made anywhere with anything. It's not always pretty. I can learn as I, as I create. And as long as I'm being creative, I am successful because I grow. <clears throat> so be you. This is a really fun one. I'm not going to share the video because we know that the sound does not work. But if you want to preview this later, this is me talking students through this lesson and just getting it started. And I would be so happy for you to use it if you ever wanted to. Um, it is on a YouTube channel that I've created and that the link from the video should take you straight there. But um, in this, um, I read the book Be You by Peter. Uh, it's one of the, it's illustrated by Peter Reynolds. And um, students wrote words that described who they are and then shared um, those words that, um, that really define them. And I like this lesson. Um, I also do a lot of work um, with design thinking and design and how that um, those standards are important. And so it's also kind of like, what is your, what are your words that is, is your brand or your, you know, um, your mantra for yourself? So, um, and here you can see some student examples and a student of mine uh, working and feeling really good about what she's doing. Um, I like this lesson because this can be a great way to get students to introduce themselves to you and to feel connected with them if you're going to be spending a few days with them. And um, so this is hitting on those relationship skills, um, the social awareness of who am I? It could help people find connections with others within the group. It might help you pair groups for uh, working in teams. Graffiti Spaghetti is another fun one. It's one of my favorite artists. I started off my middle school this year learning about Mr. Doodle. I hope all of you will check him out if he is not an artist that you are familiar with. Um, he um, is an English artist. And um, again, the videos, the sound is not working. So, but we can go ahead and move forward um, and see him here, his clothes, his hat, everything is a part of what he doodles. Um, his name is Sam Cox and he um, is 28, I would imagine now. He began his artistic career at age nine. So he's really fun to help um, students learn that you just never know where your future will take you and, and what might be happening and to really respect and honor their interests and who they are. Um, so his artwork is a playful mix of characters and patterns and he calls it um, graffiti spaghetti. 
his advice is experiment and find what you like and then just blow that up. Just keep on working and doing the things that you enjoy. Here is an article on doodling and the power of purpose um, and purpose of doodling. So I think it's, again, another article I've linked here that you might share if you want to talk about and if you especially are a visual artist and how uh, the creative process or I think it can lend itself again to any of the creative process, how it can um, help improve our capacity to improve our memory, our focus and cognition. Those are all important things. Uh, when I teach this lesson, I have students relax and doodle and then relax and doodle some more. I tell them to pick a topic. I might encourage them to pick one of their favorite themes if they really love the ocean or they really enjoy dinosaurs. Um, and we look at lots of examples and I give them bingo markers are really fun for this. Or um, if they have... Um, you can order these little bingo daubers and put um, India ink inside there or just buy the little kits. They're really popular and you can find them anywhere. You can also just use crayons or colored pencils. And then I let students doodle. It's a great way to relax. It's great for this time of the year when there's testing. We will definitely be doing some of this in the next two weeks at my school. Um, so this is just one example of how the creative process can be calming and that can be helpful as a way to help students develop ways to emotionally regulate themselves. <clears throat> and when I have students work, I often will play um, this video that is just a live stream of him doodling. So it's kind of like they're working along with the artist. And here's some student examples. There's also a grounding doodle. And this is another way to doodle. And here's a video of me working with students. It's another one that's really great for this time of year. Um, it really helps them touch on those, um, um, you know, just kind of getting into that creative space and also just, um, emotional regulation. And um, so if you want to watch that later and work on that with um, for yourself, please feel free. Um, Zentangling is another one that is very popular and um, it's actually called Zentangling because um, it's actually someone has branded this art process. I will tell you um, it's very common um, in the um, therapeutic world in general, just that one thing that we can do is to help um, cope with frustration is um, to have something to do that can distract us from things that make us feel anxious or frustrated. So I love teaching this and teaching students. This can be something you can do to help you relax when you are maybe in a situation where you know you need that. Um, and so here's a little demo video that I made and um, just some little um, directives that students can follow and how to start a Zentangle. So if we kind of look at all of these different lessons that I just kind of went over, there's different ways that, um, you know, if we, if we look at the little symbols and we think about it, um, being able to cope with stress is a way that we sustain wellness. Um, being able to navigate conflict, whether it's conflict within ourselves or it's conflict in a social situation, often we find that those two can go in pairs because when someone is feeling conflict in themselves, it's, you know, especially for children, a lot of what I see can be I'm feeling angry and now I'm projecting that into my relationships with people around me. So how can we take that way of coping, which is not healthy, and replace it with something that is healthy? Let's have a space where we can make a Zentangle or let's try to do some calm coloring or um, create your own, you know, you don't need a coloring page. You can make a doodle and you can color that. 
Um, these are all ways that the creative process can be helpful to reach some of those goals. Um, expressing ideas um, and putting our own ideas into our work, um, sometimes that can seem overwhelming. So if we structure that and we provide some clear um, guidelines for how we're going to do that today, uh, giving people the option to pick a theme or something familiar, um, and then developing networks, um, helping students recognize how they have things in common with others and how they are different and unique. Um, so I hope this slide, I just kind of did a screenshot um, of the same slide we looked at with Jeff and put it in here thinking, you know, it's really helpful, I think, on the back end to look at that. So I guess now might be a good time just to um, ask the group if anyone might have any questions at this point or any thoughts that they would like to share. Well, Elena, one thing that's interesting with your visual art is you you are using a lot of the structures that we use when we teach theater, right? Mm -hmm. To engage the students, to get them relaxed, um, to provide clear boundaries. Uh, so I think it translates from art form to art form as well. Um, the, the idea of beautiful who's making mistakes, you know, with improvisation, the idea of I am drawing um, whenever you have a, a young people create a script, it's the same attitude. So I, I'm, I'm really excited to see that it, these concepts you're sharing cross boundaries of genres. Absolutely. They absolutely do. And that's, um, you know, really um, what I was saying earlier, like when I studied and, and went into the field of art therapy, it was through a program where a lot of our learning was in teams with music and dance therapists um, and drama therapy is, is its own genre. And, and, and the, the research behind that and the, um, meaningful purpose of how it's helpful because it's all a different option of how we can communicate. And, um, you know, I think one of my favorite theories will always be um, Howard Garner's theory of multiple intelligences and how we all have our different um, ways that we understand ourselves in the world around us. And so, um, you know, while I am a, a, an art teacher, I love theater and drama and acting and dance and music. And all of these are things that are very important in my home and my family and my life to make me feel complete as a person, a part of that human experience we all share. So um, it, it really does just translate from one to the other. It just might be how we express it, whether it's in a visual drawing form or with our words and our song and, and our uh, instruments or our body as, um, as we're acting and expressing. So um, all of these things are helping us, you know, uh, as, as we are in the creative process, we're learning more that we can do hard things. We can learn from the process itself. We get better every day. And we can see our growth and our artwork and our performance. Um, we can hear it in the music. We can feel it um, as we are acting and looking back at our own performance. I think one of the most important things I found, and this might touch more on Kimberly's question at the beginning, is how to support students. And one of the most powerful things can be verbal reflection. So when you're working with students, naming um, big emotions. If you can name it, you can tame it is a very helpful thing to think about. So um, if you can help a student, sometimes they may not have the words. So you might just say, I can see you're really angry right now. And I'm going to give you a little time and space and then I will come back. And, um, you know, um, after I go around the room one time, I'll be back. And then maybe at that point, we might be able to revisit this or giving them a chance to just kind of sit and reflect with that for a little bit can be very helpful um, because their behavior might be communicating what they can't say. Uh, you can also verbally reflect back kind of what you observe, just changing your body language to sort of mirror theirs in 
um, a supportive way, of course. Um, and so just a little check-in might be you seem to be, and I'm going to, and when I come back, I'll listen if you want to talk and I'll help you begin your project, can deactivate a lot of those defenses. Um, it's important to remember that the artist determines the meaning of the work. I think that's very helpful. I try really not to project my own ideas, but to ask questions to learn more and understand that, um, you know, that also that it can change over time and that we're just kind of on this journey with our, with our kids. And we have goals and objectives, but we also, um, just can recognize the importance of the process and how it's so healthy for that social and emotional learning. Here's just a list of resources that I enjoy. The mindfulness teacher is a way that I practice sometimes breathing and movement. Um, I also did not include this here, but um, sometimes I even pull in little snippets of uh, Cosmic Kids Yoga because they have a whole series on um, mental health. And so it's wonderful. Um, there's an article here on trauma-informed ed art education that I think is very um, helpful from um, Lisa Kay, uh, who is um, the chair of art education and community art practices at Temple University. Um, and I went too soon, so let me go back. Um, Revelations in Education. This is a great resource, I think, if you find that you are struggling and working with students who are um, maybe have missed some social emotional learning. Um, this is who provided the um, the webinar I watched recently, and I think um, it was just really helpful in helping me understand ways to support students um, and help them learn about their own body um, when they're feeling frustrated, how breathing can help. Connection is not something that I think traditionally I remember learning a, a lot about in school, um, but um, is very powerful and relevant. Um, Judy Rubin was the art lady on Mr. Rogers years and years ago, and she is a pioneer in the field of um, art therapy. And so I have um, linked here um, an article on um, from her presentation on drawing parallels between art education and art therapy a link to um, Dr. Perry. And then that also that um, form on the Art, Art of Education website about a predictable environment. So let's see. I think there was just one or two more things I thought I would share. Um, if you are looking for a great resource um, on that can help um, you develop some ways to set clear boundaries and be helpful in, in navigating um, your time with students. I love this book, Teacher Talk. And um, these are actually just some little QR codes that you can scan that has some great ideas of just little helpful phrases, things that I actually went to this workshop and, and have used over and over since then. So I just thought I'd kind of plug that in there in case that was helpful for anyone. Um, you know, just ways to to talk with students in a language that is supportive, that helps them kind of understand. And, um, um, you know, I find puts them at ease. So thank you. Please feel free to reach out to me. I think I'm right on time with 45 minutes. Um, if there's ever any questions or anything I can do to support you, um, I'm always happy to, to talk with you. Um, books to recommend about art therapy. Um, so, um, <laughs> uh, well, one of my favorite books is Child Art Therapy by Judith Rubin. Um, I really enjoy this book and uh, I think she's wonderful. Another person that I recommend would be um, Kathy Malchiotti. And she um, is one of the pioneers in our field as well. And so um, she really um, explains working with different populations and just how it be expressive um, art therapies can be helpful. Um, so I, I think that would be two great starting points. And um, I think, Kathy, don't quote me, I might be misspelling her last name a little bit, but there's Kathy 
uh, Malchiati, and she is out of Kentucky. And then um, Judith Rubin. I would start with them. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you all for your time. Jeff, I'm going to turn things back over to you, and I trust everyone will feel free to email me if I can be of more help in any way. Great. Thank everybody. Join me in thanking Elena. Yay. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. All right, people, what questions do you have? We had the, she answered the question about art therapy books. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. I'm, I'm, may, Elena, maybe, or maybe in one of our conversations, we talked about the fact that where is the line that teaching artists need to understand between their work in the classroom and becoming an art therapist. I mean, how much of an art therapist do we need to be? While we're <laughs> you know, we, we had this discussion and you were particularly yeah. lucid about that. Uh, can you say more about that in, with this group here? Absolutely. So, um, so when I first um, went to school and studied art therapy uh, back in 2008, the, um, you know, it's a field, it's, it's, fairly young, about 60 years old now. And so we're still learning and growing. And um, just in the past few years um, and going to different conferences and talking with art teachers, there is so much support. I mean, um, so much coming out more about the, the field and, and people being more aware. Um, there's also a lot of talk about social emotional learning and how are we using it? And I think um, I found a lot of art teachers felt this pressure to go and seek and find ways that they could um, be doing more SEL in the art room. And um, in that, I think some even went and purchased some art therapy directive books. And um, I went to presentations where I was seeing that some of the lessons were actually not art lessons, they were art therapy directives. Um, and so that's where that tier is very helpful. And I think it's important to, um, and I hope if I, if I leave you with one thing today, it's that you are empowered to say, I'm an artist and I am helping students connect with their own creativity and imagination. And there is nothing more SEL than that. It is innate in the process. You don't need to find anything additional. Yes, you can always, you know, um, focus on calming and helping them de-escalate. But there's a lot of drawings and directives that I would do if I were meeting with someone personally, maybe based on therapeutic goals about um, what is troubling them, whether it's psychological or it's emotional. You know, when I was working in a hospital setting, the goals are very different than teaching in a classroom. And, um, you know, and, and those therapeutic directives are very powerful, but they also require a very small setting that is designated just for that. Right. Um, as an art teacher, people say, wow, I bet you get to, uh, you know, how do you use art therapy? And I'm very clear, I'm, I'm not providing therapy because that would be an ethical conflict. It, um, I, I'm grading students because I'm a teacher. And you would not want someone to do something because they felt obligated to, because it's a class or a grade. And even though they might be like, well, I wouldn't do that. We also have to think about the unconscious self and the part of us that wants to be that good student and, and do the thing that we're, you know, asked to do and, and make a good grade. And so it's really important to protect and to, um, you know, to not feel that you have to do anything extra. It, it really is a part of what, what we provide. Um, and so my message to um, art teachers and to anyone who is interested in learning more about art therapy is that it is a wonderful field, but it is very different. And that, um, that it really, you know, we, we shouldn't be doing art therapy directives in a classroom because there's a conflict there of interest. And so we have to be really clear about the goals. And there might be times that our school counselor is like, you know, I'm doing this small group and she wants to form that group. And she would like for uh, me to help her provide, you know, get some creative supplies together, maybe meeting with them at their level of comfort because that's her role. And then helping them through the creative process 
but having nothing to do with a class or nothing to do with a grade or, um, mm-hmm. and being very small, very small group. Um, therapy can't happen in a room with 25 students, which is, I mean, it, you know, depending on the school, <laughs> a lot of our schools, an issue is that our class sizes are big and um, there's no way that that can feel comfortable. People right. are inevitably going to be vulnerable. So, Thank you. Thank you. And one of the things that I've come to realize is as a teaching artist, I come in for a week, maybe 10 days, I will be working with these children in their life. And so I am there to work on my art. And yes, art impacts the social and emotional well-being of anybody who does it or experiences it. That's Mm -hmm. why we do it, right? (laughs) For that impact. However, that's not why I'm there. Right. right. I'm there to work with the young people on the art and the techniques involved and the mindsets involved. And those techniques and mindsets in turn aid the social and emotional well-being of the child. Absolutely. And I, I do want to just say one more thing about that. You know, um, we um, are creative people and we have a passion for the arts and we, it is a part of our, our everyday life. You know, we play as we make and have fun and, um, and revel in that. Um, administrators may or may not. It may not, you know, as we get older, we sort of kind of evolve as we, we think about creative development and overall development. You do more of the things you really feel connected with. And so maybe it might be sometimes you're working with um, administrators that, um, are not as connected with that. So it's important just to kind of remind them of that. You're, you're very generous with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any, any, Greg has written that there, um, the art therapy Institute in North Carolina is, is seeking an executive director. Oh, okay. Okay. So there we pass the word. If you know anybody. Know. Sure. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, Other questions, thoughts, um, epiphanies, ideas, anything at all about social emotional learning and your work. How do how do you guys how do you guys see it when you when you're there? Greg, unmute. Talk to us. Thanks. Uh, An interesting thing in schools. uh, I'm often encouraged to use SEL in teaching music, but outside of schools, I'm often teaching SEL through music. Uh, so I might actually get hired to teach the social, emotional, and learning components in uh, grief camps or uh, working with special populations or other areas. So it's a flip-flop in focus. Uh, so art for art's sake versus uh, art uh, in order to learn something else. Uh, it's kind of a neat thing to, to explore with this. Thanks. Cool. Cool. I think that's really a great way to think about it too, that was sometimes when you're invited in those special population settings, when you come in to provide the music and they're there for grief support, then that is very different because that's what the expectation is. And so it's really a lot about just kind of thinking about who is this, uh, you know, what is, what is the expectation and making sure we don't confuse and blur those lines for um, students in the school setting. But that's beautiful. I'm wonderful that you're able to do that, Greg. Thank you for sharing. This seems like that would be so special. <laughs> Other comments, thoughts, musings? All right. Well, Elena, thank you. All right. I, I've, it's been a delight for me working with you, hearing your perspective on things. Uh, you know, I'm such a, I'm such a, I'm an artist who works and, and I go through things and then there are all these other concepts and your, your understanding of the emotional content of what we do is just, it, bl- it blossoms in me. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. I I really, truly love what I do. And I love being able to share with all of you. And please reach out anytime. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Good. All right. So if you've been to any of our webinars before, as we wind down on our topic, I turn to Kimberly Mott to get some information. What's the latest on ArtsGrow SC, other programs at the Arts Commission? Where's the money? 
Um, <laughs> what should I be doing? You know, who should I know? Kimberly, take it away. Do all the things and know all the people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will scale it back a little and give you something more manageable. So um, this is sort of a, a little bit of a downtime in the area of grants and funding for the Arts Commission. A lot of our grants for schools, we're sort of winding down our fiscal year. So if you're looking for opportunities to work in schools next year, please keep in mind the School Art Support Grant, which is a grant that goes directly to art teachers or regular classroom teachers. It can support artists and residents. So if you're interested in bringing in an artist for, um, if you're a school that's interested in bringing in an artist for a residency, that grant would be for you. If you're a teaching artist, reach out to your local schools and let them know that this grant is available and could help support bringing you, the teaching artist, into their school facility. So um, that will, of course, be sending out more information, but that will be opening in July, the school art support grant for next school year. Can I jump in there just for a second? Sure, please. Because, because she can't say this, but I can as a teaching artist. It's not above our um, pay grade to say, okay, if you want me, I will help you write this grant right and here it is and and then they submit the grant with you in mind okay mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that there's, but there are definitely things that the teaching artist can provide that that the teacher could just kind of copy and paste into that application for sure yes um i also just want to share briefly with you a website and i am going to share my screen and I'm hoping that it's going to do what I want it to do. Um, so you will see on my screen, the Arts Grow SC website. This website is the home of Arts Grow SC. You can, uh, you can get to this website, um, artsgrowsc.org. I'll drop it in the, in the chat as well. Um, and you can sort of get into the different areas of the website based on your role. But one thing I do wanna show you today and Something is in the way of me being able to do this on my screen. So hopefully you're going to be able to see it. Ah, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, the the bar that I want to show you is won't let me select it. I'm coming right back. Hang tight for me. Okay. So um, I want to just show you a resource that we provide called the One Stop Workshop. The One Stop Workshop is a free professional development website that is provided primarily for, um, for teachers. But I think that there's a lot of information in the One Stop Workshop that would be beneficial to teaching artists. I'm gonna share that with you. You can access it through the Arts Grow SC website. I'm gonna share my screen so you can see it or attempt to. Don't see it there, one moment. I've got too many too many pages, screens open, and my computer does not like that. Okay, here we go. I think I should be able to share this with you now. Yes, okay. All right, so the One Stop Workshop, um, all you need to be able to access the One Stop Workshop is an email address. Um, so you just register by providing your name and your email address and your role, and then you sign into the One Stop Workshop just using your email address. Um, you can see that it's a very interactive website. I know that when I'm sharing it on the screen, sometimes it looks a little glitchy, but if you're just in here on your own, it's very, very smooth. Um, we do offer live professional development sessions at times, um, but on demand is where you might be able to access some free professional learning sessions for you. And so I'm going to show you how to get there. If you go to the, on, um, to the auditorium, you can click on these on-demand sessions. And you can select based on your um, based on your art discipline. So if you're a music teaching artist, visual art, dance, arts integration, theater, creative writing, you can choose your art area. Let's say I wanted to select music. And each of these is a professional development session. They are videoed um, and they are all available completely for free. And there's tons of stuff in the One Stop Workshop. So I want to offer that to you as a resource to be able to get 
um, more information for professional learning for yourselves. I also am going to, before we leave today, do the obligatory survey. Can't leave us without doing a survey for us. So in the chat bar, I have um, entered the link to our Google Form survey. If you could please go ahead and click on this, fill it out. It won't take you more than about two minutes. Tell us a little bit about who you are. Tell us a little bit about how this workshop has been helpful to you, if it's been helpful to you, and also other workshop topics you would like to see in the future. We will be providing these workshops quarterly for the next six quarters, so the next year and a half, essentially, we'll be having these workshops. Um, and we'd love to know if there are topics that you particularly feel like you need additional professional learning on. So please use that form to reach out to us, click on the link, fill it out, it will come to me and we'll use that for, for um, our guiding future workshops. Other than that, I just wanna thank each of you for being here today. I wanna thank you, Jeff, and you, Elena, for your time and thoughtfulness in putting together this wonderful presentation. And I will hand it back over to you, Jeff. All right, let's go to the next webinar. Hook up the new slide. We're seamless, seamless transitions. That's what we're known for. Okay, the next slide. There we go. June 20th, 4 to 5.30 p.m. Teaching Arts Professional Webinar Development, Working with Students with Special Needs. All right, so mark your calendars and that'll be our next one i will be the host and we'll have experts galore working on that and then as we fade off as we're happy singing happy trails today if we could go to our final slide we here at the south carolina arts commission thank you all of you who came today for attending the webinar and before we sign off for the day i personally would like to thank all the folks at the South Carolina Arts Commission who've been so helpful and involved in this project, especially everybody give it up for Kimberly Mott for not only giving us the information, but running the technical part today. Yay, Kimberly. And again, the crowd goes crazy. And I'd also like to thank all of our partners and they are here on the screen, the South Carolina Arts Commission, the South Carolina Department of Education, the South Carolina ABC Project, and arts grow sc thank you all of you and let's stop the share and you guys we wish you all the best if you have any questions contact kimberly contact contact elena and you can contact me right but you know they're the ones that know more than i do and we wish you the best if you have any questions along the way ask and we look forward to seeing you again soon on june 20th and thereafter. All right. Thanks for coming, y'all. Love you. Mean it. Jeff, thank you.